Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Path 11 podcast with your hosts, Mike and April. Our show includes interesting guests who are here to talk about subjects of consciousness, paranormal activity, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, mediumship, astrology, channeling, and all that good new age stuff. We would love to interview people and talk about subjects that you want to hear about. So if you have a show suggestion, we'd like you to tweet us at the Path Series. And this week's guest is Robert Moss. Yeah, Robert is somebody that uh, we, I found online a while back, but then kind of rediscovered him a couple months ago on Guy TV. And he, he just gives a really interesting talk about dreams. And I just really liked his, his view of dreams and how he studies them. Yeah, and also great that he's right in our backyard. He's located in Albany. We're in Kingston, so we're only actually about a half an hour or 45 minutes from him if we ever wanted to take any of his workshops that he's teaching here in New York. But I know, gosh, I can just think about all the times that when we started to edit our film and we were interviewing all of the people and guests uh, for our film that we were having some really crazy dreams. It seems like our dream activity once we were learning about more about consciousness and out-of-body travel that we were both coming into the editing room and say oh, what did you dream about last night yeah and particularly when we worked on beyond the physical i remember when we did the uh, hemisync reenactment uh, on the film and simulation of hemisync uh with the tones that that really put me in an altered state for the rest of the day and it was it really affected my dreams later that night and yeah i've just working on that last film i i had some crazy lucid dreams and which led to out-of-body experiences that you know, or I can't really explain, but at the same time, we're very interesting at the same time. Yeah. So I know we both find uh, dreams fascinating. So we're really excited to be able to interview Robert. And uh, before we get to our interview, let us take a few moments just to let you know who he is. So Robert Moss is the creator of Active Dreaming, an original synthesis of modern dream work and shamanism. Born in Australia, he survived three near-death experiences in childhood. He leads popular seminars all over the world, including a three-year training for teachers of Active Dreaming. A former lecturer in ancient history at the Australian National University, he is a best-selling novelist, poet, journalist and independent scholar. His nine books on dreaming, shamanism, and imagination include Conscious Dreaming, The Secret History of Dreaming, and Dreaming the Soul Back Home. His latest book, The Boy Who Died and Came Back, is a personal narrative of his adventures in multidimensional reality, since an Australian doctor told his parents when he was three, your boy died and came back. He also leads online trainings in active dreaming for the Shift Network. His website is mossdreams.com. You've had a near-death experience when you were three years old, is that right? Well, yes, I died for the first time. That's the way I think of it, and that's the way the doctors talked about it when I was three. I had pneumonia. I'm in the hospital in a bitter winter in Tasmania, and the doctors tell my parents, sorry, your kid died, and then they say with embarrassment, oh, the boy died and came back. So I had that experience of being pronounced clinically dead and coming back. I can't tell you anything much about what happened when I was out of my body age three. I can say that it was very difficult for me to be in a body in this world for the years afterwards. I was quite sickly. I had a hard time operating a body. When I was nine, I was rushed to hospital for an emergency appendectomy, and I died again. I was you know, under the knife, and I was pronounced dead, and I had during this time some of the experiences we now associate with the classic NDE, floating under the ceiling, looking at the surgery, wanting to get out of there, and then actually, in my experience, going down the beach, thinking I'm going to go to a fun park along the Melbourne shore called Luna Park, and going through the moon face, which is the gate of Luna Park, feeling traction and being drawn into a world that seemed to be within or beneath this world and being received by beautiful, radiant, slender beings who raised me as their own. And to cut to the chase, I felt I lived a whole life amongst those people. I came back with memories of a full and complete life, becoming father, grandfather, elder in a different world, and was somewhat startled to find myself back reluctantly in a nine-year-old body. And I remembered, I remembered this journey. It was very hard to talk to anyone about these things in Australia. And I'm nine years old. It's a conservative era. We don't yet have the phrase near-death experience. My, my, my family are good people, but they have no way of understanding this. The first person who could help me to understand that there is an explanation for these things was an Aboriginal kid who would say, matter-of-factly, oh, yeah, we do that. We get sick. 
we go and live somewhere else, live with the spirits. And when we get well, we come back, and sometimes we're the same, and sometimes we're not. I mean, the gift of this kind of experience is that you have first-hand knowledge, you believe, that there are worlds beyond the physical. And that's what I've known since I was a child. So I've always understood that dreaming is more than about routine processing and all of that, that dreaming might be our way of staying in touch with worlds beyond ordinary reality, including all those parallel universes that physicists talk about in many world theory. Yeah, so it seems like you kind of had a fast forward experience at a very young age, coming in at three, you know, having these near death experiences. And here you are, fast forward to adulthood, and you practice a lot of shamanism and active dreaming and running workshops and training of that sort. Um, what was your life kind of like through the adolescent times later into adulthood, knowing that this was going to be the work that you were going to offer the world? Well, my, my sense of purpose wasn't as constant as that. I think I might have known as a child that this was had marked me for a certain kind of role in, in life. But at the same time, I had to be very guarded and discreet about it as a kid because, you know, it's a conservative era. People don't know how to hear these things, don't know how to talk about them. As I say, we didn't even have Raymond Moody's phrase, a near-death experience, to make this sound like something that you could package and talk about coherently. So I learned to be very quiet in what I said publicly about these things. I wrote poems, I wrote stories. I used my knowledge of dreaming and non-ordinary reality. In my life, I did very well in examinations because I dreamed the questions before they came up in the school exams, for example. When I became a journalist, when I, well, first of all, I became a junior professor in ancient history, and I was able to do that because I dreamed into the world of ancient civilizations. I dreamed in Homeric Greek, I dreamed in other languages, and I did the research, and so I got a job very early on as a professor of ancient history. When I became a journalist, I used my dreaming, my ability to see things beforehand to get leads on stories. But, you know, I'm making a way in the world. It took a crisis in my life in midlife when I decided, when I'd already become a best-selling thriller writer, I decided to leave the fast track and live quietly on the land near Chatham, New York, upstate New York. I bought a lot of land in a dilapidated farmhouse, and I settled down there to, to live with the trees and the red-tailed foxes who lived at the edge of the cornfield and the white-tailed deer. And all of that, and I found myself dreaming in another language I did not initially understand, which proved to be an archaic form of the Mohawk Indian language. The experiences that flowed from that changed my life and shook me up so deeply that over a process of some years, I eventually gave up what I thought had been of consequence in life, like making lots of money and being famous and having your books on bestseller lists. And I became a dream teacher, for which there's no career track in this culture, somebody who's helping to remind people what dreaming, as ancient and indigenous traditions tell us, really is, as ancient and indigenous traditions tell us, and as the wise people of the future also understand. They're somewhere in between the ancient and the postmodern understanding of what dreaming really is. Now, what exactly do you teach people? If somebody were to come to one of your workshops, what does it mean to take that? What exactly are people doing in them? What techniques are you teaching them in order to learn more about their dreams, maybe explore more in that uh, conscious realm of dreaming? What does that look like for people if they were well, to attend? Well, I call my approach active dreaming. It's a phrase I made up. It's a provocation. I mean, when people talk about dreams with any interest, they often talk as if you just have a dream. It's a passive experience during sleep. I teach people to get active about dreaming in three senses. First of all, we, I teach a way of walking and talking our dreams. So you remember from something from the night. Here's a way of sharing it with someone else, which will enable you to tell your story, get some helpful feedback, and be guided towards action, and be made the author of meaning for your own life. I mean, that's really, really important to have a way of walking and talking your dreams that always leads to creative and healing action. So that in itself is new, and it's radical in a society where most of us have had no fun, easy, quick, everyday process for talking about our dreams and other personal stories. So there's that. Then this is an, this is a, an approach to dreaming, which is also a way of, let's say, lucid shamanic dreaming. There's a lot of excitement about lucid dreaming. This goes beyond that. This is shamanic dreaming. We learn to travel into the dream space consciously and intentionally whenever we like. And one of the royal roads to that is to learn to take a personal dream or image that has some energy for you and travel back inside it. Hey, you've been somewhere in a dream, you can go there again, just as if you've been to a certain house or building, you could go there again. So we learn to use our personal dreams and images as portals for shamanic journeys in which we travel consciously, typically in the workshops with the aid of drumming, 
to do something interesting, to confront the monster and overcome that fear, to talk to someone in the dream, to have a sustained dialogue, to check the information so we can avoid the road accident next Tuesday, to develop personal roads and entry points into the multidimensional universe. So we do that. We learn to journey. We learn to travel wide awake and conscious into the dream time in the way that shamans do. And thirdly, this is a way of becoming lucid, a lucid dreamer in everyday life, because central to this approach is the idea that anything going on in your field of perception can be a sign or symbol or clue to the larger reality. So we do a great deal of play with synchronicity, a great deal of play, and I've invented a lot of really fun games for working and playing with coincidence that people enjoy in the workshops and then take and apply every day. So your day starts with noticing you know, your tarot cards from the world, so to speak, the sidewalk oracles that come up as you wander around, and little scissors of magic in your life. So all of this, I mean, I lead wonderful retreats at wonderful places all over the world map, but at the end of the day, I'm very concerned that people should have things they can take back and do any day at all. So it's very much uh, an everyday approach to real magic, which is the art of bringing gifts from another order of reality into this one. Excellent. Um, now, aside from what I do at Path 11 Productions, I'm also a mental health counselor. I have a private practice, and I'm also trained in hypnotherapy. And I came across one of your YouTube videos about soul retrieval. And I find that, you know, when I read about the things that you do and I think about some of the work that I do with some clients and use some hypnotherapy techniques and I've gone back with some clients to kind of help them rescue that inner child or that 12 year old that was abused at a time and the way that you describe soul retrieval I kind of saw some similarities in using the imagination in a sense and also kind of putting a person in more of an altered state of consciousness so that they can enter into this different reality, I guess you could say, to do some of this journeying or rescuing with parts of their soul. Would you say that they're similar? Uh, well, I can see that there, are, that there are similar themes. How close the practices are, I'm not sure. Let's, let's get some words clear, for example. I use the term soul retrieval for a shamanic operation which someone operating in the way of a shaman, who might call themselves a therapist, and he's a gifted therapist, is certainly doing deep shamanic work, journeys on behalf of a client and brings something to them. I use the broader term soul recovery for processes by which we help each other to become the shamans of our own souls and the healers of our own lives. And what that means in my workshops, for example, is that we might have someone who has remembered no dreams for 30 years and now is encouraged to pull up the last dream they remember, which might be from childhood. And then with support, with encouragement, with others traveling with them, sometimes in a state of mutual, lucid, shamanic dreaming make a journey back through the gateway of that image to find the child self who went missing at a certain point in their life and bring her back. So this becomes a process of self-healing, encouraged not by hypnosis, but by the simple suggestion that if you set a clear intention for your journey and you have a clear image to use as your portal, and if you have a way of staying focused and powered, which in the workshops is the drumming, you can actually go and do some, something remarkable for yourself. And the r results can be extraordinary. I've actually seen on many occasions someone who's literally not remembered a dream for 30 years, which is how you know that they lost the beautiful bright dreamer who went missing. You use the last remembered dream as the portal for the journey of soul recovery. So this is a shamanic approach, but it's very much about putting the power in the hands and the minds of the people you know, who, who are the principals, who are the ones who need to get the part of themselves back. We use the phrase inner child, which is very familiar and you know, very, very right in some ways, but is limited in others because sometimes when we're talking about soul loss, which is the shaman's way of analyzing the root of a lot of our existential problems, when we think about soul loss, we're often talking and thinking actually about situations where a person uh, lost, lost a part of their vital energy and identity. So it's no longer exactly inner, it's sort of outer in the wrong way, in the sense that that beautiful child went away because the world was so cruel. This can be a survival mechanism in life. You're going through pain and trauma, you're going through grief, you don't want to be around, so part of yourself goes away in order not to go on feeling that pain and is not exactly inside you anymore and has to be found and brought back. I mean, this is the Paleolithic shamanic understanding of these things, and it works. I mean, and it works. So I'm sure there are many affinities 
between the work you're describing and mine and many of my friends and some of the people who do trainings with me are also hypnotherapists, for example. But I think there is something a bit different about the practice. And in our practice, uh, people, uh, people are, yes, are having their imaginations liberated. And they'll go and have their own direct primal authentic experiences and they'll be fully awake and conscious throughout and they'll come back remembering. And they'll come back with that shining light of spirit in their eyes when they found that beautiful, bright child or teen. And that's one of the great rewards in this work, probably for you too, seeing how someone is when they reclaim a part of their vital energy and identity. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I've had the personal experience of experiencing both hypnotherapy personally and some shamanism work. And shamanism work is, it just is, is much different. In my experience, there's been drumming, there's rattles, there's feathers being used. Um, the work usually, there's not really a start and end time with any shamans that I've worked with. They just have to allow the process to unfold. Whereas, of course, if you're in a clinical setting, we have about 50 minutes to get stuff done and kind of sending people on their way. But um, I find the shamanistic journey to be um, almost like a rite of passage in some ways, I guess you could say. It's just very ceremonial in my experience. And I just like the fact that when you are engaged in that type of ceremony that you take as much time as you need in order for the person to achieve what you'd, it is that you'd they're You'd probably be astonished if you came to one of my active dreaming workshops. We're dreamers who get things done on time. I mean, lickety split. <laughs> We're very low on ceremony. Okay. We're very low on ceremony. We do, so you're not going to get all the feathers and ceremonial that you're talking about. That's not a feature. And we all get things done on time. Okay, you're going to go on a journey to your younger self to be present to her in her own time and play support, support, supporter and mentor and counselor and also bring back part of her energy. You're going to do this in 20 minutes. And <laughs> then you'll decompress and we'll talk about it and see what you want to do to honor it. And then we'll go and have a pause for 15 minutes. I mean, we are literally like that. We do things terribly, terribly fast. I mean, wonderfully fast. And it's astonishing how fast and deep it goes. So we are dreamers who get things done on time. What we do build is we build a collective energy. We build a family of, a family of supporters and cheerleaders. Uh, who are going to contribute their energy and backing to everything that goes on. And within that circle of energy, wonderful things happen very quickly. It's shamanic primarily in the sense that we use drumming to facilitate the journeying. We don't do a lot of the, uh, the ritual stuff. Okay. Um, now, you've written many books. One of the books that I'm interested in talking about is The Dreamer's Book of the Dead. I'd like to know just some more information about that of... You know, it's a compilation of stories with people who have taken the work that they've learned through your workshops and also discovered that they can have contact with the other side. Our first film, we really focused a lot on what does happen when people die. What is the afterlife? Is there an afterlife? How do you communicate with those that have passed? Um, are they really there? How do you incorporate that work um, with the other side? And if you'd like to explain a little bit more about that book that you wrote. Well, I've walked in an intimate relationship with death all of my life for reasons that we've already covered because of those boyhood experiences. And to me, there's nothing exotic about the thought that we can have communication with the dead, those who are living on the other side. And there's nothing strange about the idea that there are not, not only there is an afterlife, but that there are many alternative afterlife locations to which we travel according to our desires, our courage, our imagination, or lack thereof. So, what I write about in The Dreamer's Book of the Dead and in my book Dream Gates, which are the two books which explore this in most depth, is, first of all, how and why we can communicate with the deceased and do some good for each other and learn about the afterlife that way, and how and why we can make first-hand personal journeys into afterlife situations to see closer how things work, how people are welcomed, what the transition zones are like, what choices people are guided to make, how people on the other side communicate or try to communicate with people on this side, uh, uh, and, 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 how, and how the departed often need to, to do what Yeats with poetic clarity called the dreaming back, which is to revisit scenes and people from their, the life they've now led to get their story straight and get that right. So the Dreamer's Book of the Dead, for example, explores in some depth the many ways in which we have contact with the deceased. For example, they're still around because you know, maybe they didn't move on. Maybe they've got unfinished business. Maybe they think we're clueless and they want to give us guidance. Maybe they're addicted. And then it looks at the many ways in which the deceased come visiting for all the reasons we visit each other and then some. And it looks at how healing and forgiveness are always available across the apparent barrier 
And then it looks at how, in dreams and other spontaneous experiences, we travel into afterlife locations. We may not recognize what we're doing until we look at, look at it from a certain angle. And then it looks at alternative itineraries, alternative travel options for conscious journeys to the other side to learn firsthand what all of this is about. Hey, this is too important. It's too interesting to leave our knowledge of it to hand me down information to belief texts from different traditions or to what other people say they've done. We require firsthand knowledge. And I follow in all of this the principle of the French essayist Montaigne, who said, we do not know where death is waiting for us, so we must be ready to meet death everywhere. That's what I teach people to do, to discover facts about the afterlife that are first-hand information, and then to find the courage to receive death as an ally so that you can approach life choices with the idea that you want to be ready to die. So why, why fail when it comes to taking that leap or showing that courage or taking that risk in the knowledge that death is there at your left shoulder? So the Dreamer's Book of the Dead is about all of that. So is my book, Dream Gates, and this is one of my favorite subjects. Now, when you talk about dealing with you know, the afterlife and uh, dreams of you know, communication with the deceased, do you, um, do you ever think about why this isn't in, like, mainstream media like if you turn on the tv and you watch the news or oh uh, i used to work for mainstream media i can understand why it's not in mainstream <laughs> media but <laughs> i'm i'm one of those who's growing our practice and bringing it to people where they are i mean bless you if you're helping it to bring more of it in an intelligent and helpful way into mainstream media but you know the talking classes as they're called in as they're called in britain which means mainstream media and academics are often the slowest and most conservative when it comes to opening up to things that have to do with soul and spirit. We know that. The situation is changing, and it's getting better, and perhaps you're going to be part of making it better. And you know what? We need a lot more of this because people need, in relation to these things, in relation to the knowledge of death and the afterlife, in relation to the reality of dreaming, the importance of dreaming, people need, above all, confirmation and verification of things that they are experiencing or suspecting for themselves. When I made a house move many years ago, I was putting some books on the shelves in my new office, and there's a great big guy who's banging on the French doors to the office at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I go with some trepidation. I open and says, oh, I'm your neighbor. I'm Jimmy. I just come from the graveyard. And I'm looking at Jimmy with skepticism, and I smell the beer on his breath. And he says, my dad came visiting last night, and I had to go to the graveyard to see whether he's still in the ground or not. And bless him, Jimmy did not understand that he could have a real visitation in energy and spirit in dreaming from his father, which is different from the dead rising from the grave and physically walking into his house, because he had been given no model of understanding of how these things operated, how consciousness and energy survive death. So people need models of understanding. They need to know that other people have these experiences. They need to know they're not going crazy. And you know, they, they, they need that kind of support. And hearing other people's stories and hearing people who sound halfway intelligent giving us models for understanding these things is very, very important. So we need it in the media. We need it in, in the academic field. We need it everywhere. And uh, things are changing. Yes, we would definitely agree, which is why we're also trying to get the word out through our yeah. films and our podcasts. Um, you know, I find a lot of times when people are talking about their dreams, and Mike, you might agree with this too, some of the questions would be like, oh, I, I dreamt of snakes, or I dreamt of flying, or um, what do you think this means if you dream of this? And you have all of these dream books. You can go into any major bookstore and pull a dictionary out that explains what every possible thing that you dream of means. What's the difference between that and what you offer with your other book, <laughs> Conscious Dreaming? Well, <laughs> that, is, that is the extreme opposite of what I offer, of course. I would say to right. you, you will not <laughs> find your dream in any of those dream dictionaries because it's your dream. One of the wonderful things about dreaming is this. Dreaming presents universal themes, and yet every dream is unique to the dreamer. You know, yeah, people dream about snakes. Yes, they dream about water. Yes, they dream about flying. But the specific details of the dream are individual and I would say unique to the dreamer. So any catch or blanket interpretation of a dream of a snake or whatever, even if it's got 20 different variants, probably does not include your dream. Cleave to the details of your dream, the specific elements in your dream. The snake in your dream, for certain, is not the snake in my dream. In our process of talking about dreams, I will never say to anybody, your dream means such and such. I will begin by saying, if it were my dream, 
I would think about such and such, and then I'll bring in my associations. And it really doesn't matter whether my associations are the correct interpretation of your dream or not. What matters is that I should be able to guide, tickle, and prod you towards coming up with your own best interpretation of your dream, an interpretation which can give juice and clarity to your life and give guidance, an interpretation which can lead to action. You see, this process is not about telling people what their dreams mean according to any theory or system of interpretation. It's about prompting each other to look more closely at what is going on, find our own meanings, and then take action. So you can do my process if you're a Freudian or a Jungian or a Gestaltian or anything else, or even a reduct scientist, 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 scientistic reductionist. You can play the game as long as you're willing to stand back, give up any illusions of authority, and say, if it were my dream, if it were my life, here are the things I'd think about. So you can see that there is nothing more, more, more remote from the dream dictionary approach than this approach. It is completely different. It is about empowering the dreamer to be author of meaning for their own dream and their own life and to cleave to the wonderful specific details of a dream rather than just tossing it into a dumpster with all the other stuff. And do you feel that every dream truly has a meaning, yes. that there's a purpose behind yes. it? It doesn't mean that all dreams are equally important. The way to discern, the first way to discern whether your dream is worth any effort is to consider your feelings. So the first step in our approach in thinking about any dream from anyone is what are your first feelings around the dream, your first feelings after the dream? If your feelings are neutral or blah, that probably means that there's nothing of urgent consequence here for you. You might be picking up interesting news in a larger context, but it probably means that there's nothing you absolutely have to work on right away. If you have stronger feelings about the dream, negative or positive, that would be a prompt to do some work with the dream. What kind of work? Well, you ask yourself some questions. You ask yourself, for example, what do you recognize from this dream in the rest of your life? If you're in a certain kind of situation where you're hiding or running from something, do you do that in any way in the rest of your life? So you look at that aspect of the dream. You ask yourself, could anything in this dream happen in the future? Because dreams are always showing us the possible future. I mean, this isn't a, a prime feature of many dreams, but nonetheless, our dream self seems to go ahead of the physical self scouting the ways. So you don't want to miss asking yourself, could any of this happen in the future? And if you don't like what's going on in the dream and you feel it could happen in the future, that would be a prompt to clarify the dream and take action to avoid the scenario playing out that could happen in the future. This is the way you begin. And then dreams will set you research assignments. You've got a funny word. You've got a funny phrase. You've got a symbol. You go and look it up. And in the age of auntie Google, it's not hard to get rapid information quickly on all sorts of things. I mean, so that's how you begin. And you, you really recommend dream journaling? Yes, it's absolutely essential. You're not going to be a good dreamer if you don't keep a journal because you know what? Your memory can only hold a certain amount. And if you make a date with your journal regularly, then you'll find that your recall improves. You'll also be able to do some really interesting and scientific things. Scientific in the sense of this being the science, the kind of science relevant to the subject. The scientific things you can do as you keep a dream journal are to note the incidence of precognition, of seeing things ahead of time, or of clairvoyance, seeing things across time and space. The scientific things you can do are to track your relationship with parallel universes in the many worlds in which we live. Because one of the things you'll notice going on over time as you track your dreams is you'll notice you return again and again to continuing situations that are not your present life situation. They might be similar or they might be remote. We glimpse continuous lives in our dreams. Jung became alert to this too. We glimpse continuous lives. So dreamers who journal are those who can, can, can contribute most to our understanding of how parallel universes actually work on a human level. You can do all sorts of other things. By journaling dreams, you'll find you're gathering your personal encyclopedia of symbols. Forget all those dream dictionaries. The dream dictionary you need, the only one you need, is in your own journal as you begin to track what a certain symbol means for you and how it evolves and changes over time. You dream of a train. The dream, you dream of train lines using tracks. You dream of not being sure about your destination. You dream of working on a waiting on a station. You, you track all those different dreams with the same symbol, and you begin to get a sense of what the symbol means to you. You learn to recognize personal markers or signals that will alert you immediately to what's going on in a certain kind of dream and what to do with it. And you'll notice how the dream reflects and corresponds to things going on in the world around you through synchronicity and so on. And also, let me just throw this in. 
If you have absolutely any interest in becoming a writer or a more creative person, you'll find that journaling in this way limbers up your writing muscles. You don't have to sit down and write three pages with no idea what you're going to do. You've got material to start you off. And if you start drawing and mapping your dreams, you'll find that the artist in you comes out as well. So it's a great gift journaling. I recommend it. And I would actually say you won't have much idea of what a treasure box your journal is until you've been keeping it for at least five years. You'll find that there's so much going on that you won't fully recognize until you've made it a five-year practice. Now, I'm sure you've probably come up against this, and maybe even some people take your workshops uh, for this reason, but I hear a lot, I, I don't dream. Uh, some people say either I never dream or I can never remember my dreams. I just There's no way I wake up and I can't recall anything. And I would assume that if people were coming to some of your workshops, if they are quote-unquote non-dreamers or they can't remember that the process that you're teaching might be able to open other people up to remember their dreams or to recall more detail. Um, um, what are your thoughts absolutely. about that? Absolutely. I mean, it's very interesting. I get a lot of people in my workshops who've been going through a dream drought. They've come precisely because they hope that by coming to a dream-centered workshop, they'll break the dream drought. And you know what? Usually they do. But to anybody listening, I mean, I'd say this. First of all, if you think you don't dream, all you're saying to yourself is that you don't remember. And in some cases, that's because people don't care to remember. They're not making an effort to remember. In some cases, they're trying, but it's not working. There are all sorts of reasons why our society as a whole has been going through a substantial dream drought. One of them is that the practice of telling and sharing dreams has not been encouraged or rewarded. We haven't had a good practice for sharing dreams. I mean, I've invented something called the Lightning Dreamwork Game, which is a four-step, really quick, really fun way of talking about this stuff, which gives you high motivation to remember a dream and tell it to a friend you know, any day that you can. So we haven't been rewarding and encouraging dreamers for producing dreams. You know, Our habits, our, our insistence that the, the correct way to sleep is to lie down like the dead for seven or eight hours, that interferes with dreaming. You dream, we, dream recall is higher when we, we, when, when we sleep in more than one phase of sleep, and we are biphasic sleepers sleeping in two distinct periods of sleep or more periods of sleep waking up in between for a greater or lesser length of time, writing something down, paying attention to what's going on in between one sleep period and the next in that hypnagogic drifty zone. People who sleep for seven or eight hours without waking up tend to be very challenged in terms of massive recall, and there are reasons for that. And there are other reasons for the dream duck. Sometimes people slam the door on their dreams because there's something going on they'd rather not think about. So they say, I don't want any dreams, whether they remember making that decision or not. Sometimes, ironically, people dream of wonderful, delightful things. But then when they wake up, they think, oh, I can't have that. Life isn't like that. And they slam the door and kiss goodbye to their dreams because they think they can't realize them. Whatever the reasons for the dream drought, if you're going through one, there are ways to break it. I mean, you know, I mean, first of all, you can play with setting an intention for you. The night can just be, you know, give me a juicy dream and let me remember and be ready to record whenever you wake up. And, you know, if you think you don't have anything, think again. You have something. Everybody has a hangover for their dreams, even if they don't remember the dreams that caused it. So part of the trick of breaking the dream drought is to be kind to fragments, be kind to little wisps a little you know, a bit of a tune, sense of color, tiny little vignette from the night. Don't throw it away. Don't say you have nothing. You have something. Write down what you have. It might be just a word. I remember a blob, a red blob. That's how a conversation between myself and someone who claimed she didn't remember dreams began. And by the time we'd worked that memory of a blo red blob that turned out to be a blob, a blob of red artist's oil paint, we'd taken her back into childhood into a healing scenario. It was really quite wonderful. So be kind to your fragments. Hey, and if you're not remembering dreams from the night, look at it this way. The world around you is speaking to you in the way of a dream if you'll pay attention. Look for signs and symbols in your environment. Play with those, and you know what? When you play with those, sometimes the dream source starts talking to you again because you're in the game. I mean, those are some of the ways we begin. And, you know, another thing to think about is that you don't have to be asleep in order to dream, not only in the sense I just mentioned, but in the sense that you can embark on conscious journeys into the dream state or into dreamlike places. I mean, I, I've made drumming CDs. We, we, we use the drumming in the shaman's way to go into non-ordinary reality. And some people who do not have night dreams are actually quite good on a first attempt a journey with the help of drumming, setting a simple intention, a simple intention in a simple locale, a place to explore. Beyond anything else I've said, I want to say this. 
probably the principal reason for the dream drought in our society is that many people are missing a vital part of themselves, a vital part of soul, which is the dreamer, the beautiful child dreamer who is crushed, maybe abused, maybe driven away early on in life. So if you have been missing your dreams long term, it is probably because you lost for a time connection with that beautiful young dreamer who is part of yourself, part of your identity. You want her back. You want him back. And all of this actually leads to finding and reintegrating that part of self. The Iroquois Indians of the Six Nations, who I had to learn the Mohawk language because of my dreams, the Iroquois or Iroquois traditionally say that if you've lost your connection with your dreams, it's because you've lost part of your soul. It is the direct result of soul loss. So there's hope in that thought. Okay, I'm, I've been missing this. I've been missing my dreams. I've been missing the dream in myself. How do I get it back? Once you start asking yourself that question, you're on a path of important healing and recovery and power. I have another question I'd like to know your thoughts on it. So we might be calling it a dream because we're sleeping, but what are your thoughts on maybe it's not really a dream, but we're just entering into a different reality frame that has a different rule set than when we're in the physical, where, you know, in the, in the dream reality, we can fly. Uh, we usually have conversations with people in thought forms as opposed to really speaking. And it just seems like the, the rules are different when we dream. But is it really a dream or are we just also interacting on a different consciousness level while we are our physical body is asleep? Well, that's a very interesting theme. And uh, let's sort of pick it a bit and unravel it a bit. Uh, let's start by talking about what kind of experience dreams reflect, and we'll think for a moment principally about dreams of the night, sleep dreams, spontaneous dreams we may not have asked for, which were not necessarily lucid, etc. I mean, there are three broad bands of dream experience by my observation. We have, let us say, literalistic dreams in which we see things going on in the world around us at a distance in time and space, more or less as they are or as they will be. Uh, <clears throat> the Tibetans call these dreams of clarity. They don't really require interpretation. They might require more exploration to clarify the detail and get it straight. But let's say there are literalistic dreams. But this is part. This is part of our survival radar. You know, part of our intuitive radar. We scout around. We scout around beyond the body. Now we see things uh, in a counterpart reality, very close to the physical, uh, in, in in this in this in this world. Uh, that may be remote from us in space and time. Then there are the symbolic dreams, which is what most dream analysis focuses on and what all those dream dictionaries mislead us on, the symbolic dreams. A symbol takes you from what you know to what you do not yet know. It brings together etymologically. A symbol brings together what you know with what you do not yet know, which is why some dreams take figuring out, imagination, and detective work. So uh, here, here are situations of sometimes being acted out by a whole cast of performers, it seems, by a whole production company, which is staging something for our elucidation and our awakening. So there are the symbolic dreams. Then there are the dreams, this comes closer to the points you're making, then there are the dreams that can be best regarded as experiences of another reality, a separate reality, maybe many different realities. In some of, those, some of those realities, you know, seem to have their own physical laws. I think that in some dreams, we actually travel energetically in, a, in an energy body, in a thought, in a thought as, a, as thought forms, but also sometimes in a subtle or even less subtle energy body, we travel into other orders of reality, including those hidden dimensions of reality that are speculated about in super string theory. So some of the realities we enter in dreams appear to have their own physical laws, physical laws in the terms even that we understand them in this world. In many of these realities, things happen in a different way in terms of physics than they do in this world. So you can say, yes, I mean, the, the beings are generated by thought, structures are generated by thought and imagination, and people communicate in thought forms and put on costumes and disguises suited to the order of reality in which they're operating. These uh, experiences in other realities include, of course, a lot of our encounters with the deceased in afterlife locales where they are now resident. It is, let me just say, a principal source of the knowledge of the survival of soul or consciousness after death that we have these encounters with the deceased, both when they come visiting us and when we visit them in their own reality. Uh, as for the solidity or reality of the forms that we see in, in some of these dreams experiences, well, if we're dealing with beings that might be absolutely real but are not confined to the laws of our physics, why shouldn't they put on any costume or outfit, including a bodily structure 
that they like. If we're going to palaces, temples, universities, schools, clinics, in non-ordinary reality, why shouldn't that place be generated by thought and work better than anything we manage down here? There are such places, and they're for real. And you can learn to go there consciously, and you can learn to go there again and again and again, and you can learn to meet others there. I lead people on group journeys, 30 or 40 people at a time, quite often, for example, to institutions of healing and instruction in non-ordinary reality, where we share deep and real experiences and we see the benefits right away. So, you know, these dream worlds are possibly sometimes no less real than this physical world and maybe more so. The Seneca Indians of the Six Nations say that the dream world is the real world. This uh, physical world is the shadow world or the surface world. And there's a profound idea there which is not alien to any high spiritual or mystical tradition that I know from world history that the physical world might actually, despite appearances, be less substantial, less real, less authentic than the reality which we can call the dream world. And that's, uh, in our, our films, we, we've found that when we interviewed uh, a few people that have had near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, they said that when you die, it is kind of like waking up from a dream. And uh, yeah, that's, that's very fascinating. Well, we want to thank you for uh, coming on our show. And uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of you or buy one of your books or attend one of your workshops, how can they get a hold well, of you? Well, the best thing is to go to mossdreams.com, my website. You can find me on Facebook, as I say. I lead, I lead adventures in active dreaming all over the world, so you'll see there's a very active workshop calendar. And come October, it will be 10 nonfiction books on all of this, including my new book on synchronicity, Living by Synchronicity. Okay. Excellent. Great. Congratulations. We'll, we'll put the uh, links in the show notes and uh, wish you best of luck on your, your books and your workshops. And okay. Thank you. So if you want to know more about what we do, our films and past interviews, check out thepathseries.com or you could find us on Facebook at The Path Documentary Series and our Twitter handle is The Path Series. Our DVDs are available to purchase on our website and Amazon and we're also streaming our films on Guy MTV, Vimeo and iTunes. We hope you enjoyed today's show.